Again, thank you all for coming. Um, it's a great turnout again tonight. As always, uh, if there's any topics that you do want to hear about going forward, let us know. Shoot us an email, give us a call, whatever it might be. We're always looking, how can we add value, right? I don't want to put people up here that are, you know, that don't add value, and that are irrelevant to everybody. So uh, with that, I'll throw it over to Rick. But thanks again, everybody. Yeah, thanks so much, Christian. So uh, yeah, exactly. That's why we're here tonight, is to be a resource for you, is to hopefully answer questions about long-term care, those kinds of things. And you know, Christian mentioned long-term care insurance, and you know, if you believe in it or not believe in it, and, and we are obviously strong proponents of it. It's a wonderful tool, gives you lots of options. But unfortunately, we see a lot of times with our clients that they sometimes don't qualify. They have an existing health condition, or sometimes it's prohibitively expensive. So then, you know, what are some other options that we could look at? You know, when we're trying to cover those long-term care costs. But if we have the insurance, like I said, it opens up a ton of doors. That uh, you know, that, that Medicaid, which we'll talk about today, sometimes doesn't. So one of the things that, that we run into a lot is it's a recent trend, is that you know people need long-term care, and there's a myriad of options with long-term care. When I first started practicing, it makes me feel old. But when I first started practicing, there was your house, there was the hospital, there's the nursing home, and the funeral home. That was it. You know, so now you know there's all kinds of in-home care providers. There's uh, uh, all types of different uh, assisted living from you know pretty independent all the way to just shy of a nursing home, there's nursing homes. So there's a lot more options out there. And Medicaid is a government program that's designed to help pay for someone's stay in a long-term care facility. And every nursing home in the state accepts Medicaid. So I can go to any nursing home I want to and they'll accept the Medicaid funding, but not all assisted living facilities do. Many assisted living facilities accept Medicaid, uh, but there are some that just flat out do not. So um, Touchmark, for example, a very, very nice uh, assisted living facility uh, out by Beautiful Country Club. We call it the Country Club of Assisted Living. You know, it's a really, really nice place. They got all kinds of uh, social things going on, but they flat out refuse to accept Medicaid. So if you go there, you have to be able to pay out of pocket. So that's where having long term care insurance here will be a tremendous benefit. Um, many assisted living facilities accept Medicaid, but they don't necessarily accept it right away. So one of the trends that we've been seeing is a lot of facilities accept Medicaid, but only after you've paid out of pocket for a window of time, such as 12 months, 24 months, you know, depending on the facility. So Medicaid is a giant HMO. They will pay for our state in a long-term care facility if we don't need to pay for it ourselves, but they negotiate a rate with each of the facilities. So for example, my dad was at Brewster Village Nursing Home uh, over in Appleton. Here and he had his daily rate was three hundred dollars a day. So even I could do the math, it was nine grand a month. So that's what he would be paying if it was out of pocket. If Medicaid is paying the bill, Medicaid negotiates a rate with Brewster, and they may pay like fifty three hundred dollars a month for that same room. So the Medicaid rules for nursing homes say that if you accept one resident on Medicaid, you have to accept everyone who qualifies for Medicaid. So they can't refuse anyone based on their ability to pay for their own care. But the assisted facilities don't have to play all those same rules. So they can say, you know what, we don't want to take Medicaid. So Touchmark says, we don't want to take that haircut. You know, you're going to have to pay a full freight if you're going to come here. Some facilities recognize that they can't necessarily stay fully occupied if they don't have some residents on Medicaid. So they'll say, you know, you have to pay out of pocket for a year. You have to pay out of pocket for two years. And then after that, you've met that obligation, then if you're eligible, you can apply for Medicaid. And then there are a handful of facilities in the area that do accept Medicaid from day one, just like a nursing home would. Okay, so that's where having you know the long-term care insurance, because people say, well, I'll just rely on Medicaid to pay for my care, and, and that's that's you know fine so long as you need nursing home care. But if you wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for nursing home, you could qualify for assisted living if the, the, the banking on, on Medicaid paying your options may be limited as far as where you may go, okay? So like Kristen said, this is an interactive thing, so we're here to, to learn. So if anyone has questions at any time, please, lawyers will keep yapping and yapping. You gotta interrupt me, so you know, throw a cookie at me is, is preferable, but yeah, just let me know as we go along. <laughs> so, you know, Medicaid is, is something that, you know, it is a confusing, confounding kind of a thing, so we're hopefully here today to shed some light on that. So my dad was an attorney with our firm for 40 years, before he retired, he did you know the same kind of thing I do, elder law, you know, Medicaid planning, and you know it's it's a confusing thing. His he loved to say that his biggest competition in this area wasn't other lawyers; it was tavern law. 
that you sit down with somebody and say, oh, here's the rules. And, and the rules are so different depending on someone's circumstances, depending on the nature of the assets that they have, that you know, what does work for one family doesn't necessarily work for other families. And today here, you know, we're hopefully gonna talk about some of the strategies that we use to try and preserve assets from having to use to pay for long-term care so we can qualify for Medicaid if we happen to go to a facility that takes that Medicaid funding, okay? So, you know, we got some handouts for you. Hopefully, I know we were a little bit short, but hopefully those are, are coming. But these handouts explain the eligibility rules for Medicaid. And there's one handout for the rules for a married couple when one spouse is looking at benefits. And then there's a, a set of rules for an unmarried person. Okay, so we'll start with the married couples. So if I, if my dad, for example, went into the Brewster Village nursing home and we're looking at Medicaid, that the golden rule with Medicaid, whether we're married or not, is the golden rule is up at the top of that sheet. It says you have to use all non-exempt assets that are available to you to pay for care. So there's a lot of buzzwords in there. So the first thing it says is you have to use all non-exempt assets. So that means that some assets that we have are considered to be exempt. I mean, there are certain things we can own that are absolutely safe from having to be used to pay for care, okay? And this is where these cheesy graphics start underneath. So the first thing that's exempt when we look at a married couple is a home. So if I go into a nursing home and my wife is living at home, the house is an exempt asset, cannot be touched to pay for my care. So, and there's no limitation on the value. It could be a $5 million house. If my wife's living there, it's considered to be exempt, can't be touched to pay for my care, okay? All the contents of the house are exempt as well. Furniture, jewelry, appliances, tools, guns, all of our possessions are safe from having to use to pay for care. That we can have a one vehicle of any value and the vehicle is considered to be exempt. So if I'm a nursing home, hopefully my wife will come and see me. So they let her have a safe, reliable car. The car is an exempt asset, okay? Then in the nursing home context, we'll pick up my dad, that when he was in the nursing home, Medicaid referred to him as the institutionalized spouse, kind of harsh. And they referred to my mom as the community spouse because she's still out and about in the community. So the reason why the government uses that terminology is because if we're talking about the spouses in the home, that could be confusing as far as the home, the house, or the home, the nursing home. So that's why they say institutionalized spouse, community spouse. So the community spouse's retirement benefits are completely safe, they're exempt, safe from having to use to pay for the institutionalized spouse's care. So if I go into a nursing home and my wife has a 401k or a 403b or an IRA or a pension or social security, none of her retirement assets can be touched to pay for my care. So mine could be at risk, but hers are absolutely off limits when we're looking at Medicaid eligibility, okay? Then each of us can have a limited amount of life insurance that's considered to be exempt but it's pathetically small what we're allowed to have. In order to be exempt, that the policy has to have a face value of $1,500 or less. So enough for some ham sandwiches at my funeral, and that's about it. So very, very small. So if you know I was born and my parents bought a Knights of Columbus policy for me and had a face value of $1,000, even though that policy is 50 years old and the cash value may be seven or $8,000, because the face value is under the $1,500 limit, that policy would be exempt, would be considered when they're gauging my eligibility. But if I had an NML policy that had a face value of $10,000, because that $10,000 face value is higher than the $1,500 limit, it's not considered to be exempt. So then Medicaid would look at the cash value. What can I get my hands on today? And they would count that when they're gauging my eligibility, okay? Yeah. So what makes it eligible? What makes a person eligible? Eligible, so, and that, that's we're getting, we're building to that. It's getting exciting. So yeah, so we're, we're, we're <laughs> creeping up to that, sorry. So, so that's, like I said, in, in how I coach it is when I go in and I apply for Medicaid, Medicaid wants to know about all the assets that my wife and I have, yep. but there are some things they ignore, but then there are some things that they count. So we'll talk about what they count in a, in a second. So, so the last thing that's exempt is we can prepay all of our burial and funeral arrangements. So any money spent at the funeral home protected from the nursing home, okay? 
Another exempt asset you know, that, that we really don't see a whole lot is if I own a business, if I have real estate or other assets that are used in an active trade or business, that those aren't counted. But you know, unfortunately, most people who go to a nursing home don't have an active ongoing business, but that it would be considered exempt as well. Okay. So those are the things that are exempt. I go to a nursing home, I apply for Medicaid, the government says, hey, what do you got? What do they would ignore our house, they ignore the stuff in our house, they would ignore our most expensive vehicle. If we have more than one vehicle, they don't look at the, the nicest one, but they would count the blue book value of our other vehicles that we would have. They would ignore my wife's retirement accounts. They would ignore any teeny life insurance that we would have or any money we set aside for funeral and burial. So all that would be off limits. But then the government would look at everything else that we would have. So we'd add up money we have to make, checking, savings, CDs, money markets, whether it's in my name, my wife's name, both names, doesn't matter. That a lot of people, um, you know, understandably get confused about Wisconsin's marital property law. So we'll have, sometimes we'll have couples who come in and it's a second marriage and they'll sign a prenuptial agreement that says, you know, what's his is his and what's hers is hers. Medicaid completely ignores that when they're looking at eligibility. So if my wife and I had a prenup, she inherited a million dollars from her parents, individual property, so marital property law says none of that's mine. The government still counts it when they're gauging my eligibility for Medicaid. Okay, so look at money to make. They look at investments that we would have, you know, with Christian, let's say, you know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds. They would look at my retirement accounts. If we had other real estate, so if we had a cottage, if we had hunting land, if we had, you know, rental property, for example, they would look at that. They would look at all of those assets and they would add them all up. And my wife is allowed to keep, and this is on the flip side of that page. There's a little box, a little gray box. So they add everything up, and then my wife is allowed to keep half of what we have, but there's a ceiling and a floor. She's always allowed to have a minimum of $50,000, but the maximum amount she's allowed to keep is $154,140. Okay. So, yeah, so that's it. So, so if I go into a nursing home and we have a house and we have, let's say, one car and I have a $10,000 IRA and she has a $10,000 IRA and we have $20,000 in the bank, if I go in and apply for Medicaid, Medicaid would ignore the house, they ignore all of our stuff, they ignore the car, they ignore her IRA. They would just count my $10,000 IRA and the $20,000 that we have in the bank. So that'd be $30,000 altogether. So my wife can keep half of that amount of 15, but we're always allowed up to that minimum of 50. So in that example, we'd be able to keep everything and I would qualify from day one and the state would start to pay for my care right away, okay? But now instead of saying, let's say, you know, $20,000 in the bank, let's say we have $70,000 in the bank. So again, house, car, her IRA, not looked at. They would look at the $70,000 that we have in the bank and my $10,000 IRA. So we'd have $80,000 off together. So my wife could keep half of that, 40, but we're still allowed up to that minimum of 50. So if we have 80, we can keep 50, but then the government would say we have $30,000 too much. We have too much money, okay? And we can talk about some of the strategies that we have to try and protect some of those dollars, okay? But if we have, let's, yeah, yeah. Does this change by state? It does. The reason, yeah, the reason I'm asking, I have an aunt, an uncle that lives in Indiana, and they had to be injured and sell their house, everything, in order to get in a nursing home. So they didn't have any of the assets that you're describing here in order to get in. Yeah, and, and that's, oh, you're exactly right. The, 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 these are based on federal rules, but each state applies them a little bit differently. So the rules do vary from state to state. So which in Wisconsin, you know, we, we are pretty lucky that uh, our rules are a little bit more generous than, than other states. There's a couple of states that are even better than us, but we're toe to top of what we're allowed to have. It's as sad as what we're allowed to have is, as we say in Kimberly, some states it's even worse. So. <laughs> so it's really, if somebody has assets, a minimum of, uh, as a couple, they're gonna buy over a hundred thousand, they're not going to be eligible. Correct. Correct. So, so if let's say my wife and I have one hundred forty thousand dollars in the bank and in investments, and again, house is exempt, her IRA is exempt, the car is exempt. So my ten thousand dollar IRA would be counted in one hundred forty that we have. 
So we'd have 150 altogether. So then we can keep half that 75. So 75 is more than the minimum of 50, but yet still less than the maximum of 154,000. So then you know, we get to keep a little bit more, we get to keep 75, but then we have to get rid of it. A little bit more, we have to get rid of 75 to get down to the point where I would be eligible, okay? But then like with my folks, for example, that my dad, he had a rare condition called MSA, multi-system atrophy. So everything in his body kind of started to shut down on him. It started with his extremities and worked its way in. So it started with his feet, they lost feeling his feet, his balance wasn't great, and they had 15 stairs in their house, and their sleeping quarters were on a different floor than their living quarters. So that was not a great combination. So we ended up selling their house in uh, August of 2019 it was, and then they moved into a duplex where everything was on one level. That was a great move. They were able to be there for almost two years before we started falling more and having more trouble, and then he needed uh, a little bit more help, so we had to go into a nursing home. We went in in May of 2021. So at that point, you know, like I said, you can own a home and that's considered to be an exempt asset for eligibility purposes. But my parents didn't own the duplex that they were living in, they were renting it. So the money they got from selling the house was literally sitting in the bank. And let's just say for the sake of example, for my Dutch man, that it was $400,000, okay? So in that case, my mom was allowed to keep half of that total, 200, but she's maxed out at that $154,140 limit. So, you know, round numbers, my parents had $245,000 too much. They had too much money, okay? So, a lot of what we do at, at our firm is help families in that situation. They come in and say, you know, my parents just went in the nursing home. What do we do? Yeah. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Um, referring to state rules versus federal rules, would it be, would the state rules dictate what you can and cannot have or is it a, a, a or would it be something like if the federal, federal would be more generous than the state you know which rules actually kick in so so the, the federal government lays the baseline of the rules yeah. and saying that here's what the minimum amounts you're allowed to have states can be more generous but they can't be more restrictive they cannot be more cannot. restrictive Correct. So they have to meet this baseline. Correct. And, and, uh, and not trying to be political at all, but you know, Governor Walker was not a fan of, of Medicaid, and they adopted some rules that were more restrictive than the federal government allowed, and they were challenged and, and ultimately got thrown out. So, oh, I so, remember that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. So. Because we didn't, the new legislation didn't have these minimum federal. federal <clears throat> Correct. Yep. Right. So the federal government says you can't have these things, and the state says, no, we're going to take those away. Okay. And then, thankfully, you know, from my opinion, you know, who yeah. does this yeah. for a living, so thankfully, you know, we can't do that, and they, they oh, took that away. Yeah. Yeah. Red, Red Linda, on those burial assets, do they have to be designated burial assets, or can it just be a monetary value that is just exempt? So my dad's favorite elder law joke was if you ask a 99-year-old guy if he wears boxers or briefs, he says it depends. So <laughs> very classy. Keep it classy here. So it depends on how you do that. There's different ways that you can go about setting aside burial funds. So I can set up through a financial institution, main credit union, I can set up what's called an irrevocable burial trust. So what that is is basically I just sock some money away that's earmarked for my burial when I die. So it's just like a savings account. If I go that route, I'm limited to $4,500. That's it. And tragically, that doesn't go too far these days. So I could do that, just set the money aside and say, here, you know, when I die, kids, I'm going to use this money to bury me. If I actually go to a funeral home, I can pre plan my burial, my funeral, say, I want this casket, this wall, you know, all this, this many flowers, you know, those kinds of things. And then they tally it up and they, they put up together what's called a statement of goods and services where it's just an invoice saying, here's all the different things that I picked out, and they tally it all up. And then what I do is through the funeral home, I purchase what's called an irrevocable burial life insurance policy. So I buy a life insurance policy through the funeral home, and it's through, a, I think it's Physicians Mutual, is the one that most of the funeral homes in the area are using. So it's an independent, federally you know, governed, you know, authority-backed, I should say, insurance company, and it names the funeral home as the beneficiary. So if my client plan out my funeral and comes at $8,713, that the premium that I pay is $8,713, and I give that money to the insurance company, and then they invest it on my behalf. And now I've locked in the price. 
So if I die 10 years later and my funeral is $11,000, the insurance companies have the opportunity to invest that money so they would cover that increase. So if I go that route, there's really not a hard, fast dollar limit on what I can have, but it has to line up with what's on that statement of goods and services. And sometimes we say, well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set $15,000 aside for the funeral, and then we're gonna have the old man cremated, and it's gonna cost 500 bucks and we get all that money back, and it doesn't work. So the state, the state's pretty smart, and so they have what's called the estate recovery <coughs> program that says if a Medicaid recipient passes away, that they have remaining assets at the time that they die, but those remaining assets have to go back to the state to cover, to re get reimbursed for what they spent on that person's care during the lifetime, you know, okay? So, so that doesn't work. And we had, you know, a handful of families who had loved ones pass away during COVID and couldn't go to the funeral. So they had, you know, money set aside for flowers and meals, and it was just the family, so you had this excess money, so that instead of having ham sandwiches, they had steak and lobster, but it was either burn up that money or give it back to the state, so. But the other thing that a married couple can do that an individual cannot, an unmarried person cannot, is that I can just say to Medicaid that I've got this account, you know, with Avai, and there's, you know, $12,000 in there. I am allocating that money toward my funeral when I die, but I do have to have this, the Allegheny County requires that I have a statement of goods and services that at least correlates to a $12,000 funeral but I don't necessarily have to have the money set aside in insurance policy or at the, at the credit union in a burial trust. So can't do that with an unmarried person, a little bit more flexibility with a married couple. In that scenario, that would be exempt. That would be exempt. Yep. So we've had a handful of families who come in and have a little bit more money than we thought. What do we do? They haven't prepaid their burial and funeral yet. We'll allocate, because that can actually even be done retroactively. So we could say, you know, I intended last month that that money was gonna be you know, allocated for my funeral and burial. So that's a, so that would be a legitimate strategy to deplete assets that may be exposed. Exactly right. Yep. So, so yeah, absolutely. So, so when I talk about Medicaid planning, that in my mind it kind of breaks down two ways: proactive planning, things I do ahead of time. So, if I do need long-term care in the future, hopefully I'm pretty well situated, so the state would pay for that care. But then there's also reactive planning. I go into the nursing home. What do I do now? So, and that's, we're going to talk about both that, that stuff today. So like with my folks, picking on them, my dad goes to the nursing home, they got the money from selling the house, $400,000 sitting in the bank, they can only have 154, so they have too much money. So one of the things they can do is you hear about this sometimes, the spend down, they can always spend money on exempt assets. So they can run over to the funeral home, prepay all of their burial and funeral arrangements, any money spent at the funeral home, absolutely protected from the nursing home. They could buy a new car. They could buy new stuff for the house, new appliances, new furniture, you know, new clothing. So they always have the ability to spend money on things that are exempt in order to protect it. But here I say even my mom couldn't spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars, so that wasn't practical. Wasn't going to work with them. And she could have bought a house. Could have bought a house. Absolutely. So years ago, we had a family who had too much money. Their daughter had just bought a six hundred thousand dollar house, and they had like a hundred fifty thousand dollar house and they swapped houses with their daughter, uh, and then we applied, and they got eligible. And the Medicaid rules are strange, but the government looks at us as a couple, as a unit, to initially determine eligibility, but once one spouse is determined to be eligible, that the other spouse can have assets at that point, and it doesn't affect eligibility. So for example, once my dad got qualified for Medicaid, that my mom could go buy a lottery ticket and win $100 million, and that would not affect his benefits. So with this couple where they swapped houses with their daughter, that we got the husband qualified because you know they spent, they gave the money and their house to their daughter, and the daughter gave them their $600,000 house. He got qualified. Once he qualified, that the mom you know sold the house back to the daughter and put the money in the bank in her name, and it could be touched to pay for his care. So lots of things that can be done after the fact. So. So that, that's a viable strategy, but there's some rigmarole involved there. So there's closing costs, there's expenses at work, but it was just a little bit involved. Lawyer costs. Lawyer costs, it was always lawyer costs, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, and, and the lawyer costs weren't as bad with that one. It was the, the there's transfer fees and you know, other, other things like that. So, but with my folks, they didn't want to deal with any of that. So one of the tools that we have at our disposal is a loan, okay? So Medicaid has a rule 
This is called the five-year look-back rule. Maybe you've heard of this. So Medicaid is a rule that says if I go in and apply for benefits, the government will want to know if I've given any assets away within the last five years. And if I have, the government can refuse to pay for my care. So this rule is designed to prevent someone like an Oprah from going to the doctor, and the doctor says, Oprah, if you've got Parkinson's, you're going to end up in the nursing home in two years. So she would just give all of her wealth away to charity, and then she'll, two years later, the nursing home would say, government, I don't have any money, I want you to pay for my care. Well, the government gets it wrong a lot, but sometimes they get it right. They say, well, you can't just give everything away and expect the taxpayers to pay for your nursing home state. So that's where that five-year rule comes in. But a loan is different. So what my folks did was we took the money that, that prevented them, my dad from qualifying, and say, you know, we, we had 400, we had to get down to 154. So we took $250,000 out of the bank and we lent it to my sister, because you can't trust the lawyer. So, so we lent my sister that money. So we gave her a check for $250,000 and then she signed a promissory note where she promised to repay that money back to my mom to the tune of $50,000 a month for five months. So we made that loan and then we went in and applied for Medicaid. So Medicaid said, well, why have been on the day your dad went into the nursing home, your folks had $400,000 in the bank. In order to be eligible, they have to have less than half of that amount, but no more than $154,104. So they said, what do they have today on the day that you're applying? So well, here's the bank statement. You can see there's $150,000 in the bank. You can see there's a $250,000 withdrawal. Here's a copy of the check to my sister. We made her a loan. She signed this promissory note where she promised to repay that money back to my mom to the tune of $50,000 a month for the next five months. So that loan, it's an asset of my parents and it's worth $250,000. But from a practical standpoint, it was nothing that my mom could sell or liquidate or readily convert to cash to pay for my dad's care. It was an absolute legal obligation on my sister's behalf to repay that money but on the day we went in to apply, that money wasn't in their account. So a loan falls under a very special category for Medicaid purposes. It's an asset, but it's known as an unavailable asset because the money isn't available. And if you remember the golden rule up at the top of the sheet on the first page, the golden rule says you have to use all non-exempt assets that are available to you to pay for care. So this loan wasn't available. So when the government's looking at my parents' eligibility, they disregarded the fact that we made this loan because that loan was unavailable. So the only money that my parents had that was available was the remaining $150,000 in the bank, which is less than the $154,000 limit, so my dad qualified, and the government started to pay for his care. And like I mentioned before, Medicaid rules are strange, but the government looks at us as a couple as a unit to initially gauge our eligibility. Once my dad qualified, they no longer treated my parents as a couple, they treated them as two separate individuals. So in, this was in May, in June, my mom opened up a new checking account at the credit union just in her name. My sister started making the loan payments back to my mom. She deposited the funds in the account strictly in her name and under the eyes of Medicaid and my mom, that that was her money, not his money. And it didn't count against the fellows really and they paid for my dad's care until he passed away. So a loan is a viable option that we can use to temporarily make funds unavailable for Medicaid purposes to get eligible and then have those funds be repaid. Greg. Yeah. The five-year look back. Yeah. If a, if a, a person's been gifting to the kids consistently, you know, seven years, Yeah. Uh, and, and through qualified charitable distributions, giving, you know, chunks away to charity for seven years, they look back that doesn't get counted then, right? Or is that? It, it is counted, but there is a threshold that we can have where those gifts are allowed. But the threshold is the, the cumulative <coughs> gifts in any one year to charity, to loved ones. Number one, just like you said, Christian, have to have an established pattern of gifting that has been in effect for at least the last five years. And the cumulative value of those gifts in any one year is less than 15% of the couple's adjusted gross income. So so there's there's a cap there. 15%. 15%. So yeah. So that's so yes, asterisk, but you know it's they're they're limited. So yeah. If if an asset is in the living trust, does that make it 
instead of non-exempt exempt? So, uh, so the, the fact that something's in a trust or not doesn't make it exempt. Is 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 it available? Is the question. And, and again, using a cheesy depends joke, it depends on the type of trust. So there are a myriad of different types of trusts. A living trust is a trust that's set up during lifetime. Okay. So uh, putting things into a trust is what I would consider a proactive strategy. So, but it has to be a specific type of a trust. So a lot of people have heard about a revocable trust, revocable trust. So uh, whenever I talk about a trust, in my mind, I compare it to a corporation. I think of it as a separate entity that's distinct from us as individuals. So a corporation has shareholders, people who benefit from it. A trust has what I call the beneficiaries, the people who benefit from it. A corporation has the president, the person who is in charge. A trust has what's called the trustee, the person who is in charge. So my wife and I could put together a revocable trust for ourselves, and using that kind of corny uh, analogy of a corporation, we would be the shareholders, we'd be the beneficiaries of it, and we would be the president, we would be the trustee. So we put our assets into this trust to hold them for ourselves during our lifetime. And being the president, being the, the shareholder, we can do whatever we want with those assets whenever we want. We could sit, we put our house in there, we could sell the house and buy a new house, we could you know, take out an, an investment, cash it in, buy a new car, we could liquidate a CD, go on vacation, so we could do whatever we want at any time, okay? If I pass away, <clears throat> excuse me, that my wife is still in charge, she's always in charge, but she's still in charge, she can do whatever she wants, whatever she wants, but then when she passes away, we would name what we call a successor, trustee, the vice president, one of our kids, let's say, who would take over kind of like that executive role, so they could have access to what's in that trust, sell everything, pay the bills, and then distribute everything to where we told them to you know, in that trust, where we die, everything goes in equal shares to our kids, for example. So that revocable trust, it's, it's revocable. So if my wife and I decide, you know what, we don't like this trust, we could tear it up and we could throw it away. If one of my kids doesn't call me on my birthday, I could cut them out of the trust. So we're in complete control of everything for the rest of our lifetime. So if we have assets in a revocable trust and I go into a nursing home, that doesn't protect them at all. A revocable trust affords us no nursing home protection because we talk about that five-year rule, the government would take the position the five-year clock never started because we didn't give anything away. We still have complete unfettered access to what's in there. We can do what we want with those assets when we want. So the government says, great, use them to pay for your care. So a, a, a trust can be used for nursing home protection purposes, but it has to be an irrevocable trust, okay? And using that corporate comparison, that here, if my wife and I, let's say we have a cottage, and we're worried about that cottage having to be used to pay for our long-term care, we could put our cottage into an irrevocable trust. Doing so would start that five-year clock ticking, okay? And if I go to a nursing home six years from now, we've made it to five years, so the cottage is absolutely safe from having to use to pay for my care, okay? But with the irrevocable trust, one of my kids typically would be the trustee. They would be the president. They would be in charge. And my wife and I would not be the beneficiaries of it. Our children would be the beneficiaries of it, okay? So we put the cottage into that trust, starts that five-year clock ticking, and years go by. And let's say we're not worried about a nursing home yet, and just no one's going up there anymore. The grandkids all have soccer every weekend, and you know, the kids are busy, and it's going to be a ton of work, and you know, the taxes keep going up and up. And I decide, you know what, this is just too much. I want to sell the cottage. It's not my cottage to sell. So I joke, I have to be nice to my kid, who's the trustee, they're the one who has the authority to sell it. And if they agree, great, you know, the cottage can be sold, but even though I've got the greatest kids in the world and they would do it for me at the drop of a hat, they can't give me any of those sale proceeds ever again. I can't touch any of that money. So if my kids gave me some of that money to go on a trip, to pay rent an apartment, to buy a new car, and later on I would need long-term care, regardless of how many years it was since I put that trust together, if I went and applied for Medicaid, Medicaid would say, wait a minute, if the kids can give you money from the trust for this, that, or the other thing, they can give you that money to pay for your long-term care. So it's a black hole. Once I put something into that irrevocable trust, it can leave and cash can go in, let's say the cash can go out and money can go in, but nothing can ever come back to me. So not to be cheesy, but this is the epitome situation where I can't have my cake and eat it too. In this example, either it's my cottage, it's mine, I can do what I want with it when I want, but then it's not protected. Or I put it into the trust, and it's protected because it's not mine, but then the downside is it's not mine. 
four years instead of five years, you die. Yeah. Or are you going to a nursing home? Yeah. What happens to that irrevocable trust? So, so the question is, is what happens if I die in four years and I didn't make it the five years? And this is terrible, but I say, I can die whenever I want. It's, I just can't go to the nursing home. So, right. so if I go to the nursing home before the five years are up, again, depends. So if I, you know, have, you know, uh, worked with Christian and he's done a fantastic job for me and I've got money in the bank and I can use that money to pay for my care for the last year so I can I go pay my way out so I, I put the cottage in there today four years from now I go in and I've got enough money to pay for my care for the next year now after that last year I can go up now I made it to five now I can apply if I would be otherwise eligible but if I put it in the trust today and then a year goes by and now, you know, I don't have enough to pay for four years. That's a problem. So uh, the irrevocable trust, it's irrevocable in the sense that I cannot undo it. I can't change it. My kid kicks me off. It's too late. You know, they, they get their full share. So I can't change it. But if my kids all agree, then the trust could be undone. You know, so we could sell it, let's say, and use it to pay for my care. A second home, uh, hunting land, and another large asset can you have three irrevocable trusts sure sure so the question is can you have more than one irrevocable trust and the answer to that is absolutely yes so we've had families who have done those kinds of things we typically would have one trust that would hold all three of those pieces of property you wouldn't necessarily need to but have you don't trust your kids well yeah so if i got kids spread it out you know see which kids would be nice again yeah. yeah. so three kids sure sure each. I, yeah i could do that sure so not sure if I heard the question, but it might be related to what I'm going to ask you. What about assets that are jointly owned by siblings, like the family farm? Yeah. There are five of us that own property. Can they get their hands on my fifth of it? And, and uh, again, uh, one of those cheesy depends answers, sorry. But uh, there's different ways to own property in Wisconsin with, with siblings or someone other than my spouse. So I, my sister and I could own that cottage as what's called tenants in common. And what that means is if one of us dies, our half of the cottage goes to where our will, our plan says it would go, okay? The other way of owning it is what's called joint tenants. And there's whoever lives the longest wins. So if I die, my sister becomes the sole owner of the cottage, okay? So if we own the property as tenants in common, that I die, it goes where my plan says that theoretically I have the ability to sell my fifth, let's say, you know, or my half with my case. Uh, I mean, you know, I might not have a great market for it. I may have to take a huge haircut on it, but theoretically I could sell my half. So when Medicaid is looking at my eligibility, they would consider that to be an available asset. Okay. If I own it as joint tenants, where, you know, it's whoever dies, their share goes to the other members that in that case, it's considered to be unavailable because the minute I die, my interest goes away. So there is no market, no one would pay, pay me for that, okay? But if I add joint owners to my property, I put my sister's name on today to make us joint tenants, and I go into a nursing home next year, that's still part of the five years. So, so it depends on when the, the tenancy was created has an impact as well. So, I mean, right now we're tenants in common, but we set it up TOD, transfer and death to my three children, where my wife and I are the only ones that are natural children. My other four siblings, as each of them die, their share is going to my children. But as far as nursing home assets, and they would have to, and, and if it happened that they'd have to foreclose on my share, well, what happens? So, you know, like if you need a long-term care, God forbid, and, and you go and apply for Medicaid, you say, Medicaid, you know, I've got this fifth of the farm, but it's transfer on debt, it's TOD to my kids, they get it when I die, Medicaid's gonna say, that's great, but you ain't dead, it's still yours, you could sell it now, so they would they would count it as an asset when they're looking at your eligibility. They get so, their hooks on it. Yeah, they can get their hooks on it. Yeah. The same thing will be if one of his siblings end up going into a nursing home, theirs would have to be sold, correct? Correct, yeah. yeah so. And a lot of families, you know, uh, would put together like a contract saying if one of us ever wants out, that we can't sell it to, you know, Joe Blow off the street, we have to sell it to one of the other four. And somebody will establish, you know, what the sales price would be. So that way, if 
one of them does go in, at least the other four have rights to say, hey, you know, we'll buy that share out so it doesn't get eaten up by the nursing home. Okay. Okay, so so a loan, like I mentioned, you know, great strategy that we use reactively. You know, uh, somebody goes in, too much money, you know, what do we do? Uh, we can make that loan in order to, like I said, temporarily make someone's net worth you know, lower than it would be so they qualify, and then the state would start paying for care, okay? So with my dad, you know, he had some serious health concerns. Like I mentioned, he was a lawyer, did the same thing that I did. So when we sold the house, we knew that the, the possibility was going to come that he was going to need long-term care. So we literally put the money into, you know, CDs at the credit union, knowing if he, you know, he went in, we'd cash him out, make the loan to my sister to get him qualified. Not everyone, you know, has that foresight, you know, has the ability to kind of see some of that stuff coming down the road. And, you know, some families, like I said, their their nature of their assets is different. So let's say that my dad had, you know, $250,000 in an IRA. Well, again, if he went in, we could cash out the IRA to make that loan to my sister, and we would get him qualified for Medicaid. Would you like? Okay. So, but there, you know, if we cash in the IRA, then we have to pay income tax on that. My dad would have to pay income tax on it. You know, I'm not going to contribute. So, you know, that, that would be bad. You know, that would be a significant, significant tax liability if he cashed in $250,000 on the IRA. That would all be taxable to him as income in one year. So, yes, we would save money on nursing home, but we would get annihilated with taxes. So, that doesn't necessarily work. So, you know, again, there are options, and, and when people come in and sit down with us and say, well, then what can we be doing? I say, here are the things you can be doing. Never ever have I said to a client, here's what you should be doing, here's what you could be doing. So we lay out the options. Families say, yeah, this, this thing, you know, is a great tool for us, this one is not. This one's a little uh, more controversial. So my dad's got that $250,000, but instead of being cash, it's in an IRA. That one of the things that we can do, and this is where I joke that the Hollander and me always the Catholic in me, if you know any Hollanders, we'll go cheap. So we could go to family court and we could get what's called a legal separation. So my parents could get legally separated. They're not, it's not a divorce. It's completely separate from a divorce. It's called a separation. And we would say with a straight face, my dad's in the nursing home, my mom's in the duplex, they're separated. But as part of that separation, we could ask for what's called a qualified domestic relations order. We could ask that my dad's IRA be changed into the name of my mom. So we get that court order, we let's say give it to, to a buy, they take my dad's name off, they put my mom's name on, and then we go back to family court, we dismiss the separation. We say we don't want this anymore, but now if we go in and apply for Medicaid, that $250,000 IRA is now my mom's, she's the community spouse, so it's considered to be an exempt asset. So we shift it from one spouse to the other without having to cash it in and pay the tax, but we can make it exempt for eligibility purposes. So that's something that we do if the situation you know, is right and the family's comfortable with it. We don't do it a lot, but in the certain circumstances, you know, we unfortunately see a lot of families where, like uh, my grandparents' generation, where the husband worked outside the home and the wife worked inside the home to take care of the kids, so she worked harder than he did, but didn't get paid for it. So they'll have saved for retirement, but lumped everything into the husband's retirement account. And then he's the one that goes. Now that's all at risk to be used to pay for his care. And Wisconsin, like I mentioned before, is a marital property law state. So the, the rules in Wisconsin are designed to protect the marriage. So we could go in with it. My mom taught for years, but then she stayed home and took care of us when we were born. So, you know, that's where we can say with a straight face that the, this couple planned for retirement by socking money away into one particular spouse's retirement account. And that's what they're going to use for retirement. Now, because the wrong spouse wants a nursing home, that retirement account is at risk. So we need to shift it to the other one so it's there for their retirement. And there's no, no problem with that. So that doesn't work if you've got spouses with ample balances, basically? Not it still works. Still it still works. works. Yep. It still absolutely works. Are there taxes on that if you shift it? There's is not. Your, is there a maximum amount that you can shift? There's not. Is there a time limit? So the five-year rule, you know, talks about transfers outside of the marriage. So transfers inside the marriage, that five-year rule doesn't apply. So, so there's no time element to it other than, like in my parents' case, the longer we wait to do it, and my dad's not eligible, the longer we have to pay out of pocket for his care. But we have as much time as we need, but the longer it takes, the more we have to pay out of pocket. 
Can you talk about single page? Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second too. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, probably 40 years ago, I set up all my accounts with King Central Credit Union, and there was one account that was in the trust, and all the rest were in my name. And the agreement with King Central was, if they got notified of my death, they would have dumped everything into that one living trust account. When Covanic brought them out, Covanic says, we're not going to do this for you. Uh, so right now I have my wife and brother-in-law with power to get into those accounts and do whatever they need to do. But with, with power of attorney? Yeah. Okay. So uh, do I need to go to another bank? Because I, I like the Covanic. Yeah, yeah, they do a great job. So, so power of attorney, like you said, your wife and brother have access to that account to manage things on your behalf, but power of attorney is only while we're living. So oh. as soon as you pass away, that stops. But you can set up your accounts at the bank, checking savings, CDs, money market, is what's called POD, payable on death. Oh, okay. So you can ask co-managers to say, I want to make all of my accounts payable on death to my trust. And then if you pass, your wife, brother, whoever the trustee would be, is just bringing a death certificate to co-manage, and then they dump the funds over into the trust. Okay. That works. Real easy and free. Thank so you. So love that. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the other thing just want to mention quickly, you know, with a married couple, is that, you know, we have had families who come in and say, you know, dad's going into a nursing home, you know, mom's living in the house, but they do have a cottage. They do have hunting land. What do we do about that? So that, again, it's not exempt. If it's not a homestead, it's considered to be an available asset. But there's a specific Medicaid rule that says, if I own a piece of real estate, and that real estate is listed for sale with a licensed realtor, that that real estate is considered to be unavailable. So it's got value, but until it sells, it doesn't mean there's money in my account that I can use it to pay for my long-term care. So, so we had a family who came in Husband and wife, husband had to go into a nursing home. They owned a condo in Appleton that was their primary residence. And then they had a condo in Arizona that they would spend winters in. So the husband had to go into a nursing home, again, relatively quickly. So they came in to see us. They get the house. That's where they're living. It's exempt. Couldn't be used to pay for care. But the condo in Arizona was a luxury. Governor says, you don't need that condo in Arizona. So it could be used to pay for care. So we worked with an attorney in Arizona to retitle the condo there into solely the wife's name. So we took the husband's name off, put it just in the wife's name. And the wife happened to have a friend who was a realtor and lived in the same complex that they were in in Arizona. She had a realtor's license, so we signed a three-month listing contract to sell that condo in Arizona. We did that in October, I want to say. So we signed a three-month listing contract, and then we went in to apply for Medicaid. Now, the realtor didn't take a picture of it, didn't put a sign in the yard, didn't do anything. We just signed the listing contract. So we went in to apply. The government says, what assets do you have? Said, well, we've got you know the condo here in Appleton, that's the wife's primary residence, so that's exempt. We have a condo in Arizona, but here's the listing contract, it's currently listed for sale with a realtor, you know, and here's the rule that says because of that it's unavailable. So, like the loan to my sister, when they're looking at eligibility, they disregard the fact that they own this condo. Based on this couple's assets, they qualified and the government paid for the husband's care. Once one spouse qualifies, they're no longer treated as a couple, they're treated as two separate individuals. So three months later, the listing contract expired, and the condo was strictly in the wife's name, and she's there now spending the winter. So again, another tool is we can list real estate that's not exempt. We can make it unavailable by listing for sale with a licensed realtor. So. All your examples of, well, like this one where his health fails, he moves in, she's living at home. Yeah. When she moves into the home, into the nursing home, same rules apply, right? No, no. So, so the question was, if you know, we're talking about we're picking out the husband going into the nursing home. What happens if the wife follows and goes to the nursing home shortly after that? Do the same rules apply? And of course, they don't. So, so if my mom had to go into, of course, you know, uh, if my mom had to go into the nursing home, like it, when my dad was there, that my mom was allowed to keep certain assets because she was what's called a community spouse. She was still out in the community. So if she's in the nursing home, there's no more community spouse. So now the rules are completely different. So my parents in that case would both be treated as unmarried individuals, okay? So great segue, we can talk about the rules for an unmarried 
person, okay? They're much more harsh, I hate to say it. So, so the single page, you know, the single sheet for a single uh, applicant, there, again, same golden rule that you have to use all non-exempt assets that are available to you to pay for care, okay? So here though, the hard part is, is that there are fewer assets that are exempt. So a homestead is listed there, but I would, you know, I need to put a gigantic asterisk on that sheet that a homestead is considered to be exempt only under very, very limited circumstances when we have an unmarried person. So my dad's first stint in the nursing home was in 2012 when he had his knee replaced. He went there for rehab. And 100% of the stay was covered by Medicare. So we didn't have to worry about any of this stuff. Medicare paid the bill. He was there for about three weeks, came home, everything was great. But Medicare will pay for a rehab stay at a nursing home for up to 100 days. Okay, after that, that's it. So let's just say that my dad didn't recover as well as he'd hoped, and he gets to that day 100, and now he's not well enough to come home at that point. Well, now we could look at Medicaid. Medicaid would allow my dad to keep his home, and then we disregard it when we're looking at his eligibility, so long as he expressed his intention to return home. He says, you know, I just need a few more weeks, and after that, I'm gonna get back home. Then they would let him keep his house, and they would ignore it for eligibility purposes. If my dad otherwise qualified, Medicaid would pay for his stay at the nursing home, but they would put a lien against the house, okay? So if my dad did get better, and, and a month later on you know, day 130, he was able to come home, that lien would go away. But if he died in the nursing home, never having set foot back in his house, if we kids go to sell the house, that lien would be there. We'd have to repay the state for what they spent on my dad's care during a lifetime. And if there's any money left, then it would come to the family. So again, only under very rare circumstances is a home considered to be an exempt asset, okay? So our contents though, our stuff, that's still exempt. So we can have all of our personal belongings, that can't be touched to pay for care. As an unmarried person, I was allowed to have a vehicle of any value, but the vehicle is exempt. You know, when I first started practicing, there was an asset limitation on that. I could only have a vehicle that was worth $4,500. So that would not be a very nice car these days, maybe a moped. Yeah. When you talked about the lien on the home, yeah. if the if your dad goes back to the home, he, he does actually go back to the home, then does that lien get taken off? The lien gets taken off. Yep, the lien okay. goes away. Yep. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. so what if he's home a while? How many days would he have to be home before he could go back to the nursing home and not lose his home? So he has to be in his home when he dies. When he dies. Yeah. So if he's in the nursing home, then that lien is still gonna be there, okay. so. But if he went home for two weeks, got sicker, had to go back to the nursing home, got better and could go back home again, does that work? Still fine, still fine, yep. So it could so, keep doing that as long as he could go home for a little bit? Correct, and, and you know, there's a famous, uh, so I, I'm a member of an organization called the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. Wisconsin has its own chapter, there's about 150 members and we have meetings, you know, twice a year. And, you know, one person uh, was able to, the person expressed their wish to die at home and they were on Medicaid, they owned their own home. They got home, four hours later they died because they died at home, the lien went away. So, so yeah, so you can drag me out of the bed and get me back home, you know, do it. So household contents, again, those are exempt for Medicaid purposes, we can have a car, Again, now of any value as an unmarried person, I can acquire any value and that, that qualifies. The other thing just to, to throw out there is that uh, elder law attorney's uh, favorite saying that a lot of us have is that pigs get fed and hogs get slaughtered. So there was a woman who had, uh, went into a nursing home unmarried, she had a bunch of cash that she bought a like $350,000 Bentley vehicle. It was a little sports car, tiny little thing. She used a wheelchair. And she wanted to apply for Medicaid, so this is my exempt asset. And they said, you know, Medicaid actually said, we'd love to see you get in this car. She couldn't get in the car. So they actually disallowed that and, and uh, assessed the penalty. They said it was an available asset. They counted just like $350,000 in the bank. So again, let's not be crazy here. Let's you know, use these rules, you know, appropriately, but let's not go, go overboard. So so that, that didn't work. Yeah, you need a driver's license? You do not need to have a driver's license. So, so we had a client who had about well, $30,000, she went into the nursing home, and she, her daughter was actively in the market to buy a Subaru, she had four daughters, and the Subaru was like $29,000 in change. So the mom bought 
the Subaru. And then what happens is the daughter was able to use it to bring her to hair appointments, to bring her to church, to bring her to doctor appointments. So you can have a car that doesn't have to, um, you don't have to be able to drive it. If someone else can drive you, that's all that matters. So you're allowed to have that car. And we talked about that five-year rule. There are a limited, limited number of exceptions to that five-year rule. One is that after a Medicaid applicant is qualified for benefits and the government starts to pay for their care, at that point, they can give a vehicle away and that doesn't affect their eligibility. So this woman bought her car, that $29,000 car, got qualified, immediately gave it to her daughter who was gonna buy it anyway. And the daughter who was gonna shell out 30 grand gave $7,500 to each of her three sisters. So she got a $30,000 car for $22,500. Each of the daughters, other daughters got 7,500 bucks. So everyone you know, benefited and the daughter did use it to bring mom to appointments and those kind of things. So again, that's another tool that we have that you can't give away a vehicle and that five year rule doesn't apply. But the, the sequence has to be right. The person has to be eligible for benefits before they can give the car away. Okay. So same thing, you can have a teeny tiny life insurance policy. Yeah. Always talking about the family or daughter. Yeah. Um, she's always had to be uh, a member of a family, or could it be a niece or a, a neighbor? Or could it be your favorite lawyer. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, it's just, yeah, you're exactly right. You know, we use down your favorite advisor. Yeah. So I use examples. You're exactly right. I showed it. You know, they talk about kids a lot, um, but uh, it, it can be it can be anybody. Yeah, it doesn't have to be children. That and again, my mindset oftentimes not correct necessarily is that people come in and they say you know we've worked so hard our whole life that that my parents went through the depression when they died we didn't get anything that's very very important to me that i leave an inheritance to my kids and and that's you know sometimes what motivates some of these discussions that we have now you know we joked a little bit about it but you know i have to have faith in the people that i'm going to be necessarily turning things over to sometimes i'm going to be proactive and give things away so, you know, to go outside of my nuclear family sometimes can be a little bit nerve wracking, you know. So that's why a lot of times, you know, when people do these gifting strategies, we do use kids because, you know, do I have the confidence that the niece and nephew neighbor is gonna, lawyer, definitely, you know, not give it back. You know, so if, if I don't make it to five years, you know, what, what happens, you know, that's where, you know, we wanna have confidence in those people that we're gonna be, you know, cooperating with to hopefully help get things protected. So, so I use kids as an example a lot, it doesn't have to be kids. So again, funeral is protected as well if I'm unmarried, so I can prepay all of your funeral expenses, that's all protected as well. But then after that, and it's on the back side of the sheet, the most I can have to qualify as an unmarried person is $2,000. That's it. So again, I, I don't make these rules, I don't agree with the rules, but basically the government takes the position that before they put the burden on the taxpayers to pay for my care, I should exhaust all of my own resources, use up my money first, before the state would kick in. Okay. So again, someone comes in who's unmarried and goes into a nursing home and they've got too much money. They say, wait a minute, is there anything we can be doing to protect what they've got? And the answer is absolutely yes. So again, same strategy that we have the ability to spend down those funds. I can buy exempt assets, I can go buy that car, I can prepay my burial and my funeral, I can buy things for my new, new comforter, new dresser, new you know, chair with a lift in it wheelchair so I can always spend my money on exempt assets and the funds I spend are really safe from having to use to pay for care. But again, you know, there's, there's only so much typically that we can spend. So that's not always a, a viable strategy. So again, you know, another thing that, that we can do is we can use a loan again, but here it's just a little bit different, okay? So you can see here that that, that five-year rule the five-year rule says if I've given any assets away within the five-year window prior to applying for benefits, that the government will refuse to pay for my care. And they'll refuse to pay for my care for the length of time that my gift would have paid for my care in an average nursing home in the state of Wisconsin. Okay? And right now the average cost of a nursing home in the state of Wisconsin is $9,599.80 a month. That's on the back of the, both sheets, okay? So, let's just say for my simple, simple math that I go into a nursing home and I've got $192,000 in 
in the bank. Okay, and I come in, you know, see the lawyer. Hey, is there anything I can do? So here we use lawyers aren't too creative. We use what we call half a loaf theory. Okay, so here the example would be is I'll take half of the money. Let's say my mom goes in. My dad passed in October of 2021. Let's say my mom goes in now. She's got 192 thousand dollars left. So. She comes in, and what the plan would be is she would take half of that money, she'd take $96,000 and use it to make a gift to my sister, because again, she's the favorite. So we'd make a gift to her, knowing because of this five-year rule, that's going to be problematic, okay? But it's all part of the plan. So make a $96,000 gift to my sister, then my mom would make a $96,000 loan to me. And I would set up that loan so I would repay my mom $9,600 a month for 10 months, okay? So we do that, then we would go in and we would apply for Medicaid. And let's say that the cost of my mom's care is $11,000 a month. She's at a fancier nursing home in the statewide average. And again, just for my simple math, let's say she has $1,400 a month coming in from Social Security, okay? So we would go in and we would apply for Medicaid. So Medicaid would say, well, wait a minute, you know, what assets does your mom have at this point? And say, well, she's got her car, that's exempt, can't be touched. She's got her prepaid bureau and funeral, can't be touched. She's got all her personal belongings, that's all exempt, so that's fine. Say, so here's her bank statement, she's got $1,000 in her checking account. They say, well, she can have up to $2,000 in qualifying, so that's great. Then I say, she's got this loan. She lent me $96,000. Here's a copy of that check to me. I signed this promissory note. I'm gonna pay that money back to my mom, $9,600 a month for the next 10 months. So just like when we made that loan to my sister with both my parents, that a loan is considered an unavailable asset. That money isn't in my mom's account, can't be used to pay for her care. So it's disregarded when they're looking at her eligibility. So they would say the only assets that my mom has that are available and, and not exempt is the $1,000 in her checking account. She can have $2,000 in qualifying. So they'd say she's eligible we will pay for her care, but before we do, we need to know if she's given any gifts within the last five years. And here we'd say, absolutely. She just gave a gift of $96,000 to my sister. Here's a copy of that check. So here Medicaid would say, now wait a minute, that's money your mom could have kept. And she could use that money to pay for her care. So because she gave that money away, and five years have not gone by, we Medicaid will refuse to pay for your mom's care for the length of time the $96,000 would pay for her care in an average nursing home. So again, they would divide $96,000 by $9,599.80, and it comes to 10 months. So Medicaid says, we aren't gonna pay for your mom's care for 10 months. And let's say this happened last week, so February 1st. So they wouldn't pay for my mom's care for the next 10 months. They wouldn't pay for her until what, December 1st. So what happens is, my mom would get a bill from the nursing home for the month of February for $11,000. So then she's gonna get her $14,000 of Social Security for the month of February, and now I'm gonna start repaying that loan to her. So I'm gonna give her $9,600. So she's gonna take the $9,600 loan payment plus the $1,400 of Social Security, that gives her $11,000 that she needs to pay for her care. So she'd use that money to pay for her stay, and now her month of February is covered at the nursing home. March comes, she gets another $11,000 bill, I make another loan payment, she gets another social security check, she has that money to pay for her care. So we do that every month for 10 months. And when it gets to be December, we go back to Medicaid and say, okay Medicaid, you wouldn't pay for my mom's care for 10 months because she made that big gift to my sister, but she paid for her own care for those 10 months using the loan payments and using her social security income. So she did the crime, she did the time. So her 11 month, 10 month penalty would be done and in month 11, the state would take over paying for her care. So the $96,000 loan that she paid to me, I had to pay that money back, and my mom had to use that money to pay for her care, so that money would be gone. But at that point in month 11, when the state takes over, the $96,000 gift that was given to my sister, at that point, that money is protected. So that's why we call it half a loaf theory. So you can, unmarried person goes in, they have too much cash, we can still protect at least half from having to use to pay for their care. And that's if they go to a nursing home. If they go into assisted living, where you know my cost of care is $6,000 a month, even if I'm there, they, the Medicaid doesn't look at the cost of my actual care. They look at the cost of the average stay in a nursing home. 
So, you know, the way the numbers work is that I can make a bigger gift, which is a result in a longer penalty, but if I know a facility that costs $6,000 a month, I don't need $9,000 coming back. You know, if I've got $1,400 coming in, then I'll only need $4,600 of loan payments. So I can make a bigger gift, have a longer penalty, but smaller loan payments over a longer window of time. So if someone goes into assisted living, normally we'd be able to protect between two thirds or three quarters of what they have, depending on what the cost of care is and what their income would be. Okay. So again, it's not quite the same as using just a loan like we did with my dad, you know, with a married couple. With an unmarried person, we can still use a loan, but we use it in conjunction with a gift. Okay. Yeah, Christian. Single person, anything to do with retirement assets? So great, great. You team up for me. I so appreciate it. So yeah, so with retirement assets, again, if I go into a nursing home and I have an IRA that they treat it just as money in the bank. So it's counted, it's not exempt. It has to be used to pay for my care. But again, if I'm in that scenario where I my mom would cash in the IRA to make the gift to my sister and the loan to me, a great strategy, but we're gonna get hit with taxes. So a twist that we can use is instead of making a loan to me, that we make a loan to an insurance company. So let's say that my mom has $96,000 in cash and $96,000 in an IRA. Well, instead of cashing out the IRA and paying the tax and then you know making the loan to me, that my mom can use that money to purchase what's called an immediate annuity. So maybe you've heard of a traditional annuity, a traditional annuity I convert like a CD, and so they give money to a bank or credit union, I give it to an insurance company. The insurance company invests that money for me, and then at some point in the future it matures, and I get my money that I originally invested back, plus interest, okay? But like a CD, at any point in time, I can cash that annuity in. I may have to pay an early withdrawal penalty, but I can always get my hands on the money. So a regular annuity doesn't help me in this scenario because I can always get my hands on the money. An immediate annuity gets its name for the fact that they give the insurance company money and they immediately give it back to me, okay, in equal monthly installments. So here, instead of making a loan to me for you know $96,000, but I pay my mom back $9,600 a month, the mom would use her IRA to purchase an immediate annuity through an insurance company, and then the insurance company would pay my mom that $9,600 a month for the next 10 months. So in my example, that wouldn't be a great strategy because all the money would come out in the same tax year anyway, so it would still be taxed to my mom. But if it's a bigger amount, you know, if it's let's say 16, 18 months and someone goes in in you know, November, that you could have those payments spread out potentially over three tax years to lessen that, that hit, you know, for paying income taxes instead of having to cash it all in. So great, great question. So, so that's where, you know, my dad's corny joke about the tavern law, but it's true, you know, depending on the nature of some of these assets, whether they're married or not, that the rules are totally different, the strategies are totally different about how we would approach trying to take steps to protect what they work so hard for. Hopefully everyone has a lot of wine at home. Your head is swimming. Your glass of wine is not thinking about this stuff. You can also use long-term care insurance, right? Long-term care insurance, again, is the ace in the hole. That, that's, again, if I, you know, I talked about before, if I use that example with my mom, that you know, we could do this money to protect it you know, after 10 months. If my mom goes into an assisted living facility that has a two-year private pay requirement, there's nothing we as attorneys can do. My mom doesn't have enough money, so we can get her eligible in 10 months, right? But the facility doesn't take the funding until two years have passed, there's nothing we can do. So having a long-term care insurance, again, is my ace in the hole that I have all the options on the table as possible. I can go wherever I want because I have the insurance to pay for it. I'm not limited as far as you know, those private pay requirements. Mm -hmm. So like I so said, these strategies that we talk about are if we don't have the ability to get long-term care insurance or long-term care insurance we have is We've had clients who got it in the 90s, you know, and they don't have an inflation rider on there, and it pays $80 a day, you know, which is terrific, but the average cost of care is $315 a day. So sometimes the insurance just isn't enough to cover the entire cost. So long-term care costs obviously have exploded compared to, you know, the, the benefits of them. So yeah, if we can get long-term care insurance, we always try and get long-term care insurance. If we can't, that's where you, know, you look at other strategies. I don't think anyone dozed off, so that's always a victory. So, <laughs> so how are we doing for time? So, any more topics?
What's that? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, the only other thing I would point out yeah. is that, like with my dad, when he went into the nursing home, we were blessed that he had 100% of his faculties until the day he died. He was sharp as a tag. But he went into the nursing home in May of 2021 in the middle of COVID. So we you know, needed to do some of this maneuvering with the funds. I could have you know, driven him over to the, to the nursing home, gotten my gown, gotten my mask on, you know, got him in the wheelchair, wheeled him down into my car, wheeled the wheelchair in the back, driven him down to the credit union to maneuver this money to make this loan to my sister. But that was a huge pain. So what happened is we had a power of attorney. So I was able to use that power of attorney. So I went into the credit union and said, hey, I need to move some of these CDs around, liquidate them, dump them in my parents' checking account. I need a cashier's check to my sister for that $250,000. So that power of attorney was an absolutely critical, critical tool that we use all the time in Medicaid planning. And a lot of people don't have powers of attorney that they assume, well, I'm married, my spouse can take care of everything. And that's not the case. So if we have a joint account. Absolutely, my wife can get into our joint account. But if I have an IRA, by definition, an IRA is an individual retirement account, but my wife has no authority to manage that at all. So having a, a critical you know, power of attorney in place is unbelievably important. And the state of Wisconsin offers a, a power of attorney form that you can download online. And, and that's good for like, I got kids who are both over 18, you know, that's fine for them. But for nursing home planning, there's a lot of things that the power of attorney can do that isn't included in the state's form. So one of the things we talked about was the half a loaf theory. My mom gives assets away, makes a loan to me. So gifting is something that can be done, you know, by my mom, let's say she goes to the nursing home, she's always free to make gifts on her own. But if she's not competent, the agent under a power of attorney can make gifts, but only if the power of attorney document authorizes that. The state's form does not authorize that. The state doesn't want people to make gifts, so that the state has to pay for their care. The state wants people to pay for their own care, so that's not included in their power of attorney. Another thing that's not in the statutory power of attorney that we think is critically important is the ability to change beneficiaries. And a lot of estate planning attorneys say, why on earth would you ever want somebody to have the ability to change your plan? And 97% of the time we don't, but once in a while we do. So with my parents, for example, that my mom had a life insurance policy and me and my dad is the beneficiary, like every married couple in the world. Well, if my mom passed away first and my dad's a nursing home on Medicaid, he gets those life insurance proceeds. Now he's got too much money. So he gets kicked off and we have to deal with that. So we want to change the beneficiary. We were blessed, my mom has 100% of her faculties, so she could change beneficiaries whenever she wanted. If she couldn't, that a power of attorney can change beneficiaries so long as the document authorizes that. The state of Wisconsin's form does not authorize that at all. The other thing that comes into play is we talk a lot about the front end stuff with Medicaid. We touched on on the back end a little bit, but the state of Wisconsin has what's called the estate recovery program. It says if a Medicaid recipient or their spouse dies under certain circumstances, the state can recoup funds at that time to get reimbursed for what they spent on care. So my dad died first, my mom's still alive, so because of that, the rules say that the state can't recover anything from a surviving spouse. So the state couldn't recoup anything from my mom after my dad died. But the rules say that after my mom dies, that at that time, the state can come after up to one half of the assets that she has in her name to get reimbursed for what they spent on my dad's care during lifetime. So again, the theory of Wisconsin being a marital property law state, half the assets are my mom's, half the assets are my dad's. So when my mom dies, the state can come after my dad's half of the assets. So what we did was after my dad went into the nursing home and got on Medicaid, we signed a post-nuptial agreement, like a prenuptial agreement, but they were already married. And it said instead of owning everything together 50-50 as marital property, that my mom owned everything. Everything was exclusively hers, which is what she said was the case for the first 60 years of the marriage of anyway. So, so everything was just hers. So then my dad passed, and we put that on file with the state to put them on notice when my mom dies, the state came after my dad's one half of the assets. The only thing that was in my dad's name at the time that he died was he and my mom had a joint checking account where his social security was going into, and there was $700 in that account on the day he passed. So because everything else was my mom's individual property, the state could only recover up to $350 when my mom dies. So the point is, is that that post nuptial agreement, critically important, and again, we could have driven a notary up to the nursing home to have my dad sign that. That was really difficult during COVID. So my sister signed that post nuptial agreement on my dad's behalf using the power of attorney. The state of Wisconsin doesn't authorize an agent to sign a marital agreement on someone's behalf. That's, that's something we put in our own powers of attorney. So it's not there. So 
The state's form is good for some situations, not the elder law thing. So again, having a power of attorney in place that does everything you need to do is critically, critically important in order to do a lot of this planning that we're talking about. So, so that's the, the luxury part of it. So, so. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, I, I don't need that. Okay. This is the time in the program where you test your knowledge. Did you guys take notes? <laughs> yeah. The quiz? <laughs> Thank you, Reg. Oh, we appreciate it very much. My name is Dave Jensen. I, I'm new to Abide. Um, it's great seeing everybody here. New faces for me, some familiar faces. Um, we hope she, we hope you you know took a few nuggets. As you can see, this, co this topic can be very complicated. Uh, we just encourage you, if you haven't uh, updated your estate plan, um, if some of these topics may be something that you need to dust the cobwebs off. Um, just think of Reg and his firm. You guys do a great job. Uh, we've had a wonderful partnership uh, in my previous world. Um, even known, um, I think our fathers uh, both practiced law um, and ran into paths over the years. So I encourage you to think about that. Obviously, if there's some financial topics that we can be of guidance on, um, reach out to us. Uh, ask us. We just appreciate your time and consideration. And uh, we'll stick around for a little bit. But thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Anybody? Thanks so much for having me and thanks for coming out.